Hello. We don't know. Yeah. We're all global. We are live and we are global. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. I, I love it. I've never been around the world except except with except with Zoom or Be Live or no. Skype. It's kind of amazing. So my name is Dr. Tova Goldfein. This is TMS Roundtable. Rose, my my wonderful um, devoted co-host and professional partner is up at 4 a.m. and shows up here at 5 a.m. in the morning in Australia. Wow. You are my hero, Rose. <laughs> Can you introduce Thanks, Tova. yourself and then our wonderful <laughs> tonight, today, this morning? Good morning, everyone. Today, we have got a wonderful guest, Hilary Jacobs Hendel. She's the author of It's Not Always Depression. Hilary, can you hold up your book, please? Sure, I will humbly hold up my book. Here's the Thank American. Thank you. Just so that you, around yes, the world. <laughs> she has it published in the UK and in the US. Now, Hillary um, has coined a phrase called the change triangle. It's based on an original um, uh, concept from Milan in Tavistock in the um, UK. And now she has developed it more deeply. Now, for our audience here who have chronic pain, it's a way of connecting to your emotions sort of uh, as we speak, as though intellectually, put it that way, so that you can see a, as a type of education of what's gone on that's created that chronic pain. Hilary, please come join us. Thank you for being with us. Please give us a little bit of a bio and then go in and also, Give the audience an idea of how this book came about because Hillary's story is beautiful and I'm sure you'll all love to hear it. And then how she developed the change triangle. She's got some, um, or Tova has got some posters she can put up that you'll be able to look at afterwards if, you, if it's not clear to you. And it's on our um, TMS Roundtable YouTube channel and it's on Hillary's website and it will be on our Facebook page. So welcome, Hilary, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you Can so you much for me. <laughs> give us a little bio. Sure, I'm just delighted to be here, and hi to everybody out there. Um, let me just begin with, I developed a, a out of my own, and I, I don't want to bore you with too much of my story, but- No, 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 bore us. I will. I will. I'll tell you a little bit. But the, this, this sort of starting from the, the, the top to give people a reference is I grew up in New York City with a psychiatrist father. And um, we knew all about therapy and we knew all about talking about anxiety intellectually. Uh, but I, I had no idea what an emotion was. And in, in my own therapy early on when I was young, I went to a therapist in college because they offered 15 free sessions. Um, there was really no talk of much about what an emotion was and why we had had and what happens to emotions when we bury them and what happens when we learn to experience them. And that kind of, when I began to become this type of a therapist trained in emotions, uh, in AEDP and the ISTDPs, uh, and it was transforming people to learn how to work with emotions. My pet peeve that we don't get any emotion education turned into a moral outrage because there's just some basic things that everybody can learn that give you tools, both at home, self-help tools, and also tools that you can bring to a therapist or find a therapist that knows how to work this way that not only helps but really can transform the, the the mind and the body by taking advantage of what we know to create positive neuroplasticity right how how can we change the brain so that we spend more and more time in confident calm states of being right we can't spend all our time there because emotions happen and they upset us but we really want to build a lifelong practice of how to know who we are and what we need and then how to work through emotions when the challenges of life hit us and they will and everybody suffers and let's just begin there. But you, but should I give a, a sort of a quick synopsis of um, my history and how I, you wanna- Yeah, it, it, how, yes. I, how um, you came, like you had, had you yeah. published your essay published in the U yeah. New York Times and that, that 
yeah, you weren't you weren't supposed to be in this direction. There was some, you know, aha moment. Um, yeah, it was like, and and also that you started off and then go on about starting off in psychoanalysis and attachment theory needed to be added to psychoanalysis, etc. You say it better than me, so please yes. go ahead. <laughs> Well, I started life, I was a real science nerd and I was going to go to medical school and I decided I didn't want to do that. And I became a dentist. I don't know if you know that. So I became a dentist and that was my first career, which was a colossal failure. And then I floundered for many, many years. Oh, that's stressful to be yeah. stressful. Yeah, that, that's a whole other story, which I'm, I'm happy to go into. But to make a long story short, I had a few kids, I went through a divorce. I had to find a, another career. And um, I tried different things. And then at the age of 39, I, a friend of mine actually said she was going back to social work school to become a therapist. And it was like a light bulb went off. And I thought, that's what I'm going to do, too. And I've always been interested. In fact, I was like a little analyst at the age of 10 and 11. And I remember my friends yelling at me to stop analyzing them. So I, <laughs> I tried to curb it. And I didn't have the confidence, I think, in my 20s to do that. So I went back to social work school. And my intention, because in New York City, the pinnacle of a career of a therapist is really um, becoming a psychoanalyst, which is four years training after you get your license, after social work school. And on my way to becoming a, a traditional psychoanalysis, a psychoanalyst, by dumb luck, a friend of mine suggested I go to a, 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 a trauma conference and it was on attachment theory and trauma and emotions and that's where I first saw Diana Fosha who was the developer of a type of psychotherapy method called AEDP accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy of which ISTDP is a cousin and affect phobia therapy is a cousin they're all developed from Davin Lu in these short-term therapies and when I went to this conference, my first exposure, Diana Fosha put up this upside down triangle that explained how emotions worked in the mind, but most especially the body. And I was like, emotions are in the body? Oh yeah, like that makes total sense. But until somebody said it, it didn't really occur to me. And I was so turned on, not only by what I learned, it made so much sense as a way to be a therapist and a way to be in the world about focusing not only on our thoughts, which are so important, but that we're connected to a body and that emotions really live in the body and our history, our emotional history is sort of stored in our body. And um, so I studied this, This I studied, I became a psychoanalyst because I feel like I, I felt like I needed that legitimacy, but I went on to become a certified ADP therapist and a certified supervisor. And that's really my home modality. Um, I've studied other things and I work them all together. But what, um, what's, what's really important is I was working with patients um, that, that were given to me in my psychoanalytic in the clinic there that I felt this, the analytic stance was not only not helping, but creating more shame and creating more reticence because I, I was not talking enough, not engaged, not actively working to create, to co-create a sense of safety, because how can we expect people to go to these very uh, vulnerable places unless they feel like they're not gonna be judged, unless they know they have someone that actively cares. And so I began to apply my AEDP therapeutic techniques and, and philosophy to these, an, to these analytic patients that I, I came to really see had a trauma history. And one per person in particular that I ended up uh, submitting an op-ed to the New York Times about this, this guy, Brian, it's a, it's a code name, had this interesting history where he had been, had major depression for decades and decades in and out of psychiatric hospitals, many, many psychiatrists, many, many medications, um, many different diagnoses. And when, when he came to me, I did not think it made sense to reinvent, to do the same thing. And so I questioned the whole diagnosis of depression. And I thought, let me, recon let me reconceptualize him as, a, uh, as someone who had symptoms of trauma from childhood neglect, 
and let me use AEDP principles. And he got better where, where he didn't get better from any other type of therapy. And I thought this was so important that I finally felt like I had something to say. I was never a writer um, and I never really had anything that I felt was worth sharing. But this I did. And so I, I wrote an op-ed on a lark. I sent it in and they published it. And the article went viral because it's so human. We all have the same emotions work in the same way for all of us. And from that article, I, I got approached by two book agents, literary agents in New York City. And um, one. Come back, come back, come back. One of them, you know, I said, I'm not a writer. You see, said, um, said you can and what do you want to write on and i said well there was this triangle that i really think is a public health tool that everybody should know this because i was telling i was showing this triangle which is basically an upside down triangle that diagrams emotions anxiety and defense defenses the ways that we avoid emotions for protection we need these defenses and so i ended up writing a book a self-help book for the public that showed what this type of therapy looked like because I knew I had to write stories because you can't think your way through an emotion, unfortunately. They have to be experienced. And the only way to show an experience is to tell a story. And so I wrote mostly, there are seven stories in the book, but then showing how we're working through these defended and anxious states on the top of the triangle, helping somebody go down into their body name the, the core emotions of anger, sadness, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, and sexual excitement underneath their anxiety, right? That the anxiety is like the tip of an iceberg, so is the depression also. And that when we can help somebody name their emotions in their body and experience them and have the energy come up and out, it gets out of the body and gets out of the head and the whole nervous system and the and brain will reorganize in a more integrated, regulated way. And it works and it's so helpful that I really think that, you know, in high school, everybody should have a basic education and emotions in the change triangle. And then at least they have the knowledge to decide, you know, where they want to take it from there. So that's what it's all about now is emotion, emotion education. Do you think now, Hilary, that you'd like to um, dive into that triangle now and maybe Tova sure. bring up the... Um... Well, I want to ask one quick question. For it. It was like, yeah. Yeah, one quick question. Um, so if it's not depression, then what is it? I want to just right. to move on to that a little before the triangle. It's because like... <laughs> it's the way... <laughs> it's what happens... So to be a human... It, is to suffer and it's to suffer emotional challenges so the reason we have these core emotions darwin i didn't invent anything new i basically if i have a talent it's taking complicated concepts in science and the academic literature and making it so that i really wrote the book so anyone 15 years old and up could understand and it's like a beach read i didn't i don't like boring books i just wanted it to sort of here's what you need to know and here's how to make it interesting and so turns out that emotions are triggered out of awareness. So like there's all these myths that we're supposed to control our emotions. I grew up thinking that I was supposed to have mind over matter and that if I was very emotional and needy, that that said something bad about me and I was weak and all these sort of myths that we grow up with that create so much shame and that, that make us want to control our emotions, which we can do, but only after, after the price. At the right. price. And, right. And the price is the epidemic and anxiety and depression and suicidality yeah. and personality disorders and eating disorders and workaholism, all those things that in the world. So, so um, I'm, it's writing, very I'm writing it down even 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 smaller. Yeah. So because I've learned a lot, you know, working with Rose over the last year and a half, I've learned a lot about how to verbalize what's happening down here and you know, even I might have thought, because I, you know, what do I do with my emotions? Well, you know, and what do you mean? All I have to do is just accept them. What? I don't have to do anything. So then, you know, we're talking about the doing mode and the being mode. But so basically, then 
Yeah, so so we just accept and witness and observe and recognize. Is that where you go with the with the triangle? That's, yeah, that's the beginning. So I think the where I go with the triangle is the first thing is to is to get the intellectual, the understanding. I really think that when people understand that emotions are, are they they get triggered out of conscious control, and the first thing they do is they connect to the lower brain. They they happen in the middle brain. They connect to the lower brain, and then they affect every organ in the body. And that's why that picture of the vagus nerve, if you want to show it, is so uh, is so like um, astounding in many ways. So. Frank Netter, who is a uh, an anatomical artist, he's um, an amazing artist. I have a lot of books from him. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see here, but you know, the starting at the top is where the 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 nerves connect into the brain, and then they go into every single organ in the body. And the reason that emotions affect every organ in the body is because their job is to get us ready for movement, and that movement is either to uh, have us move away from something that's dangerous to our survival or move us towards something that's advantageous for survival. Like when we're interested in something and, and novelty and when something makes us happy. So when we're scared and angry and disgusted, that's a movement away from things that are bad for us. And so it's all about the body. But most people don't know that they think their thoughts are happening in their head and so the first thing to understand is that's why when you have an emotion it feels uncomfortable and when you begin to understand how emotions work it demystifies them and that sets the stage for allowing more and more people to begin to get curious about their emotions and to begin to work with them because it's not an easy thing to do it's so worth it and the truth is we have pain and discomfort when we're anxious and depressed. And so we're trading that for a more active approach, to leaning into the, uh, in how emotions feel in the body and allowing their impulses and their energy to, that we actually have to notice it and be present with it and listen to our emotions. And if we get at, if we take obstacles out of the way, like, um, like shame, right? So if we, let's say, uh, I, w I grew up in a family where we didn't do sadness, right? My mother uh, believed in cheering someone up. We didn't go to funerals. We were like anti-sadness. And what ends up happening is that when there was loss, which is the, so when there are losses, whether we lose a loved one or we lose an object, a cherished object, we feel sadness. So sadness correlates to a loss out in the environment. And then when sadness gets triggered, it affects the body, right? And we feel, uh, some people feel a heaviness. Um, some people will automatically cry or feel something behind the eyes. Some people will feel an impulse to crawl into a, a ball or to reach out for comfort. If we block that because we grow up in a family that says, well, we don't do sadness. And they, no one teaches us how to me with sadness without trying to fix something just like it's okay to be sad how wonderful would it be for everybody to know that it's okay to feel sad and it's a temporary feeling and so what ended up happening is anytime there was a loss i got anxious because the feeling of sadness comes up you can't prevent that and the the muscular tension and the stopping of the breathing and the change in the posture which is all the things that we do to keep down emotions then what we then the only thing I could experience is anxiety. And as I got older and I wanted to go to support a friend who was experiencing a loss or I wanted to go to a funeral, I was just riddled with anxiety until I understood that and then I knew I had to build my capacity to just feel sad and um, and just tolerate feeling sad with somebody without there's nothing you can say, right? There's nothing to fix. You just want to help somebody through by just being a presence wow and that would have been nice to have learned when i was maybe 16 years old in a, in a high school health class so or but it's too everybody late everybody could like replace it everybody could substitute like they get in pain and they get they can't they, they lose everything they forget when the pain comes 
because pain is means something's wrong. Pain means that they they didn't they didn't accomplish not being in pain. So the perfection thing. So I'm thinking about a, you know, a number of people that, well, but I have good days and I'm having bad days because the pain came back, as opposed to I'm having a neutral day, and the pain came and went. So I got to learn. You know, it's it's something so specific and so personal. And I, I wish there was a formula, like you just spoke as if like, well, yes, we didn't do sadness, so we didn't do pain. But well, there is a formula. Well, there is, but not everybody, like it's not working all the time for everybody. And this is the frustration people feel because we're human beings and we're not scientific animals, robots. Mm -hmm. So what's the formula, okay. Rose? Well, Go ahead. Okay, well, maybe Hillary can bring up the other triangle. Let's do it. And exactly what you're talking about can now be seen by everyone is that is that okay hillary uh yes yes so, i mean what about is, the other one well this Could is the a, other tr this is a good be one. better i think this is fine i mean anyone out there listening um now or in the future can just google the change triangle and you can download it from my website and you can put it up on your refrigerator and many people diagram their own but in the main in the main the three corners we have defenses. So let you just talked about perfectionism or worry, right? So let's say I have let's say I have pain in my shoulder, or let's say I have a, a pain in my like a tightness in my chest. I might, if I don't understand um, how pain, or if I don't understand emotions, uh, I could start judging myself. What's the what's wrong with me? Or um, I shouldn't, right? The shoulds, I shouldn't be feeling this way. These are all defenses. We go up in our head and we tell ourselves that we're bad and we tell ourselves that things shouldn't happen. And in a way, even though that's painful, it keeps us out of our body and away from um, being with what's really going on, which is the not only the pain that we feel, but the emotions that go with that pain that are either influencing that pain, like, like blocked and buried anger, which is a big one, um, but also the sadness, the, the compassion for ourselves that we have to suffer is much better than judging ourselves. And as you can see, the, the whole idea, this is, it's hard to, to point. I almost feel like I could show you this triangle as, as we're talking, if I can figure out. Yeah, that's better. That's better. So the goal is to begin to notify the defenses that we have, which is on the top left corner of the change triangle. And a defense by definition is anything we do to avoid emotions. And in this particular triangle, which I took from um, the Emotions Education 101 class that I give, that's an eight week class, um, that's not therapy, but it's very therapeutic. Um, we were talking about anger in that class. And some of the symptoms of buried anger is depression, uh, being withdrawn, back pain, feeling guilty, and then people pleasing all the time, difficulty setting limits, um, you know, lack of confidence and self-esteem because we've buried the anger using these inhibitory emotions of anxiety, guilt, and shame, and they all push down emotions in different ways. And then when the anxiety, guilt, and shame and the mix of core emotions in the body is feels too yucky and uncomfortable, we move to defenses where we pretty much lift ourselves away from the body. And that's why if you imagine this change triangle superimposed on your body with the point being in your body, which is where the core emotions live, those, those those very important emotions that we're trying to get to we when we when someone does something to let's say insult us and anger is a natural response to having an attack whether it's an attack on our ourself on our personhood a physical attack a sexual attack um, anger will naturally be triggered and it will create changes in the body so that we can protect ourselves and anger is a primitive biological, emotional program that wants to be mean. We are not our anger. Our, our core self can notice our anger, but we have to separate those two things. So when somebody triggers our anger, we can either block it. That's what this line a little above the corner of the triangle is, is 
depicting. When we block it, we go, we block it with anxiety, guilt, or shame, or we go into defenses. And what we want to learn to do is when we know we're triggered with a core emotion is to learn how to experience it. And there's sort of five kind of a list of five ways that I teach to experience an emotion when we have to be able to recognize we're having it. So somebody attacks me and I feel that jolt in my body. It's like, mm, what just happened? I, I'm insulted. I'm annoyed. I need to be able to say, you know what? I know I just got triggered to anger. I feel anger. I know I'm angry because I feel an energy in my stomach that's coming up and out. I feel like I want to make fists. I feel a tightness in my jaw. So we all have to learn how the core emotions affect our body. And then I can use a mindfulness stance to notice the the physical sensations of that anger, right? That's the ticket is to be able to build a capacity. And this is a lifelong practice. Some people get it right away. And some people that have had more trauma and less support and more wounds in their lives need the support of a therapist to do this. And it takes longer or not sometimes a session, but we need to be able to stay with the, the impulses of our anger and figure out in a variety of creative creative ways, how to release that anger. Fantasy is one way where you can imagine what the anger wants to do. Using techniques from somatic experiencing, we can just follow the sensation until that wave moves through us and the, the anger doesn't get stored in our muscles or stored in our mind where it makes us kind of get, you know, become resentful and, and brittle or arrogant or these kind of defensive character states. And so that is the trick is to, is to learn how to be with emotions physically and learn how to move through them back to when we do that, we enter the state that I call in the book, the open hearted state of the authentic self. If I was going to talk in scientific jargon, it's a state of, of, regulation that the um, the nervous system is goes back to calm and regulated and then we can think again when we're in this state we there's all these c words that describe it that i borrowed from richard schwartz and in internal family systems therapy we feel calm we feel connected we feel clear in our thoughts we feel much more confident uh, we feel much more compassionate to ourselves and others and so there's all these good things that happen when we learn how to be with emotions and that's how we heal and ease anxiety and ease depression. Can you add in that little bit about love? Yeah. And love can come out. Oh, well, you see in the book, I wanted to do a, a simple, I, I, there's other emotions that one could, I could have put on the change triangle, but I wanted to provide a basic emotion education. So I didn't talk about relational emotions, which would yeah. be in the next book if I was going to write it on two triangles. Like people together, yeah. each, we're all on the triangle at any given moment of the day. And so the yeah. relational emotions that we talk about in, in, um, in AEDP are love and longing and desire and you know jealousy might be in there and all those things that happen um relationally between two people yeah here's a question from scott yeah. uh, in in the uk my muscles in my neck and back have become so tense and sore i was considering a manual therapy like massage i'm struggling more than i ever have where would you recommend i start Hmm. Well, that's such a good question. And I, and I love massage. But if it's if, Scott, I guess I would say is if you have a sense that you're under a lot of stress, like most people these days, and that there are emotions that uh, might be stuck in the body, I would also work with someone who does this kind of work. I, I might start by just reading It's Not Always Depression and seeing if the ideas resonate. Um, I don't think there's another self-help book for the public that's easy to read on emotions that I've come across. Maybe the body keeps the score. Um, that's but more you, technical though. Yeah, yeah. You, 
start by just reading. You could also just start by going to a, a massage therapist and seeing if it helps. All of this stuff with the mind and body and healing is a completely creative process. Yeah. And it's you want things that are backed by science, but then it's like whatever works. Yeah. As I think Mary you David know, said. Yeah. yeah. You know, the most important thing is a massage would be wonderful if he's if Scott's feeling his anger, his fear, his frustration, I think any of the physical things, I, I think people have to really accept that this is the road and the road from the head to the heart is the one we all have to walk. And that's where the disconnect is because we're walking from the head to the head. But I think that it's, you know, like it's easy for us to avoid from the head to the heart and think something else is going to work. So everything will work as long as you're walking from the head to the heart. This is yeah. And, and I would add one thing um, to all the men listening out there. They, they get such a, 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 a raw deal in society. Men from the time they are little boys are taught that emotions are not manly and they learn to shut all their tender emotions away. Oh, They're yeah. being humiliated by their father, by their uncle, then by their peers, bullying. I mean, it is outrageous and it's incorrect because it is all men and women and every gender in between have the exact same emotions and it's not your fault we need to live in a society where there's some basic information we take high school bio and learn we have an esophagus and a spleen but who needs to know that it's much more important to understand how emotions work in the mind and body because we are hit with emotions every day we can't help it it's just how humans evolved the emotions are really the the fast acting communication between the environment and our nervous system and it, well, that's a beautiful just, statement you like that yeah i mean that's <laughs> thanks the Dover. emotions and the are, are, are in a relationship with the environment you say yeah. That? yeah that in other words what's happening out there affects us and what's happening between people affects us and people even because we all have a unique way of seeing the world that's based on our unique genetics and unique experiences from the from even the moment we're born, if not before. So we all have this unique lens and we're trying to get along and communicate and we don't get skills in communication. We don't get skills in emotion. We're often misinterpreting each other. We're often using words to mean different definitions. People fight, people assign intent and bad intent when everyone is just a human being just trying to feel safe and loved and good about this. Yeah. Yeah, and safety then, and love yeah. is so so important. Yeah, yeah. And I see Scott just wrote. I'm I'm so angry. I'm bottling up so much stuff. The more in my mind, the more I hurt. Exactly. So thank True. you so much for writing that, Scott, because that's what exactly what we're talking about. And of course, that's what happens because when you push down anger and that all these emotions have energy and not energy in the woo woo, you know, my father used to scoff at emotions. It was very California, my father, the psychiatrist, but emotions have biological energy. Yeah. But emotions are from California, not from New York. <laughs> I mean, that's all changing, thank goodness, with uh, trauma informed ways of thinking. But there's real, if if the goal of, ener of emotions is to make the body move, Every, all these biochemical processes and physiological processes are changing our body to mobilize huge amounts of energy to run or to, you know, to flee or to fight. That when we wash that down with muscular tension, you know, not breathing, that's another way we hold down emotions. You just hold your breath and it pushes them down. It puts pressure on all the muscles and all the systems in the body, and we get muscular tension, we get stomach ache, we get irritable bowel, we get all sorts of problems. Yes. Um, so it makes sense. This is all actually very logical, even though emotions themselves people don't think are logical, but they work in a very predictable way. It's, it's, I you, once you know your own pattern, pattern yeah. like, you know, we all have this pattern. Once you know your pattern, like, oh, there it goes again. I yes. Like not to be surprised. Exactly. So Siona um, has a question. She says that uh, this sounds so familiar to ISTDP. I know you said they are cousins. Can you or Rose address the differences? Um, 
I'm happy to do that because I know AEDP and I know ISTDP. Uh, but but you can. I don't know if you know AEDP. No, no, no. You no. You're you're the guest. Yeah, it's a good question. I I studied um, ISTDP um, both in New York with a supervisor, and um, I went to uh, Alan Abbas's immersion course and and read in Halifax, and I and I read a lot. And I guess the main difference is that AEDP brings attachment theory in a very big way. So the first thing when we work with a patient is we are creating, um, we're co-creating safety through the relationship. So I am actively, um, I'm just allowed to be authentic and warm in a way that I wasn't allowed to be as an analyst. And I'm sure there's many ISTDP therapists that are very authentic and very warm, but it's an active part of the theory. And um, we don't pressure in terms of that intrapsychic crisis to get the anger out. We use empathy. And I personally work with parts so that we would we would help somebody, you know, if somebody came in and said uh, they're angry at this, at their spouse for, um, for this, and I would ask what that feeling is like in the body. What, what are they feeling what, in their body as they're sharing, you know, this experience with their husband? And then my next question after they sort of named this experience they were having would be to say, if you bridge back in time, have you ever had that feeling before as you as you go back and back and back in time and most of the time oh yeah yeah you know from the time i was six years old when my parents ignored me or told me i was bad i would get that feeling and then we can begin to work with a child part um and so we're working a lot with with parts uh historical parts that hold emotions that might be different than the emotions or the intellectualization that we know today. It's like, I know that my husband's not meaning to do this, but um, I can't stop having this feeling and this trigger and then being mean and nasty or cold. And so um, it's bringing in the attachment piece from long ago and currently. But I think we do that too with, I'm thinking of the triangle of persons where yeah, we're- It's just, identical, there's nothing yeah, there's it's, nothing different. Though. Yeah, it's, it's just, different. just the diamond of Forsha is the is the um, uh, person who promoted that. Whereas Alan Abbas, because he's male, I guess, yeah. speaks differently. But it's the same. It's the same. It's the same triangle. You know, same triangle because without going back to the attachment pattern and the attachment pattern that we've actually created in, and you know, you said it's even before birth, and often you know it's interuterine. But people don't notice that until you actually bring it up, that this is how mother and father were or mother was on her own or whatever. And then they actually, um, uh, you know, can make connections. And once the connections are made, they actually dissipate. Uh, how would you describe that, Hillary? You know, like you make those connections and they don't own you anymore. How would you, how would you describe that? You know, I, I don't, I think it's, beyond making the connections so when i hear you say and i don't know how you you can tell me how you mean it like that i think of as more like insight when you make those connections yeah. that's wonderful. but then uh, to me that's the beginning of a piece of work and then we're into uh you know using a particular we try to get a um a, a concrete example of when that experience has happened before and then back to working the change triangle to help somebody liberate to move through the emotion and and uh, and after that liberated yes, yes. liberated yes. Yeah. and and through the liberation of the emotion the brain rewires and it's yes. it's, it, it, yeah. wow. it's like the, the amygdala it I, doesn't need to be activated anymore yes and the way i think of it this is my when i teach about um uh trauma and like if you, this is a lemon squeezer if you think of the lemon squeezer part as the authentic self, the way we were born, and then all these are the um, are the the neural networks that wire an experience. So if we were repeatedly abused, oh, wow. then this we've got this big, big, big sort of network. Wow. Anytime yeah. anything reminds us of that abuse, it lights up like a Christmas tree and it covers up our authentic self. And oh. Beautiful. To, you like that? And then what we're trying oh, I love to it, Hillary. create space again 
and oh, untangle these networks by liberating the emotion. Beautiful visual way to do it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, can you do it again? Uh, can you show, yes. show the audience? Give it, give it how, a different example, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, very good. How, they, how it covers up the authentic self. Yeah. That's yeah, so important. From my own life, I used to be like, um, oh my gosh, uh, I would say, let's give an example of when my sister got married, she no longer spent Thanksgiving, which was our main family holiday. And every Thanksgiving, when she had to go to her in-law's house, when she got married, I would get in this tizzy where I would want, I'd be so upset, I would feel the impulse to make her feel guilty. I'd get in a mood, right? So here's the, the mood that was triggered by this feeling I finally figured out. It was a feeling of neglect that came from my parents that, um, that, that and it's these things are so subtle right because i got a lot of freedom so sometimes that was good and sometimes it must have felt like neglect and so if i didn't get enough attention and my parents were big figures to me so they sort of gathered up a lot of attention in the room so so i made the connection that my um that thanksgiving evoked this neural network and for many years though all i felt was this horrible mix of guilt and anger and i couldn't really i didn't feel myself until I started to understand how to work with through becoming an AADP therapist, that when I had the mood, I could start to get a little space by, by connecting to the mood and being curious and compassionate, right? That's, that's maybe a difference of ISTDP that I, I really actively say, I, can we be with this emotion with, and can we be with the feelings in your body with a sense of radical, compassion and curiosity for yourself, just getting to know it, really asking any judging parts of you to try to step back in the waiting room. And then by getting to know this neural network, basically I try to get, I help people get an image of the part. And I, I began to see myself as a six-year-old girl. And then I began to really get in touch with the core emotions beyond my, what I would do is I would get angry, but all core emotions can be used defensively too. And underneath the anger, there's just a very tender need for attention that I felt was shameful. And so once I gave myself that compassion and the recognition that it's okay, you just feel abandoned. You just, it's okay that you feel sad, that you miss your sister. And by processing the sadness and allowing myself to cry a few times, maybe a few years, it just, it diluted the, you know, what I imagine. Again, this is just an example. The, these these networks, these neural networks, start to get more integrated, and they're not like a live wire anymore. I just could feel now when my sister went to um, to Memphis for Thanksgiving, I would feel hmm, I really wish she stayed <laughs> stayed here with me. I miss her instead of that crusty, guilt ridden, resentful anger that I didn't like myself because. I love wow. my sister. And she's very good to me. So, um, now Scott, did, did Scott? Are you, hopefully, you're listening, Scott, because this is so much <laughs> of what is going on for you. Yeah, it's not. It's not the masseur that will help you. It's more oh, it the hurt. recognition that things aren't always good. But unfortunately, there's we there's an acceptance we need to acknowledge, isn't there? that life hasn't always been good. Yeah. But you're still alive and you're still okay yeah. underneath it all. And you've come through the other side. Yeah. And you yeah. didn't do anything wrong. It's nobody's fault. Um, yeah. most, of the time, most of the time our yeah. parents do the best that they could and our teachers do the best that they could. Um, and even if they didn't, it's been and gone. Often they don't do the best they could mm -hmm. with neglect. But at the same time, it's been... And until and until the so people like Scott see that, yeah, that, that their lives are worthwhile, even if they weren't told they were worthwhile in the beginning, they are. So, so hopefully, yeah. Scott, you saw that uh, as a very personal understanding of your true self being hidden behind those neural pathways that, that are creating the pain. If anybody on these sites or visiting us, it's like. They're so smart to walk this road and say there's something else here. 
there's a psychological cause and I'm definitely struggling to find it, but I know I'm gonna I'm in the right place. So Scott, like all the honor to you for in this journey. Um so there's a there's a question here. Um can I just say one thing to Scott and everybody yes. here? Yes. I have um I love creating free resources and on the on YouTube I have a change triangle YouTube channel and Scott and for other people out there I have kind of like these mini gentle meditation exercises and one of them is connecting to your younger self some of them are other connecting to anxiety connecting to other emotions those may be oh, worth lovely just to see if they help and again you try something and if it doesn't work no big deal then you try something else it's, it's really yeah. just trying yeah. yeah. so Fanny Fanny Sharma, um, Sharma, I have a very bizarre melody of anxiety and chronic pain, weird tingling and chronic itch itching, and it follows a certain pattern like clockwork. Although I am glad that it can't seem to give multiple sensations at the same time, I know that is a hyper aroused CNS, it just doesn't want to calm down. I practice this being an anxious state to perfection for a year and a half and wait no i practice this being in an anxious state to perfection for in a year and a half and strong neural connections are made that i can't seem to break mm. yeah and so when you say i practice this fanny it's, it's i'm so glad you you shared thank you for being so open and, and oh he practiced what you what yeah okay. So I would be curious, I practice this. Um, what is the this? Are you practicing right. being with the, the, the emotion? Are you practicing being with the sensation in your body when you have it? I would treat it almost like a panic attack in a way where you would stay with the sensation and breathe and try to, one, notice what happens with like 20 seconds of attention. Uh, if that's possible, um, there's a, oh, I inadvertently practice it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what you want to try to understand is, one, this is an, an important communication and it's a message and that's the beginning. It's a symptom and it means that there's something underneath it and it could be related to a wound or a trauma that maybe you know of and, and when it first began and you can sort of be a good detective. But then the way you would heal it is by by being with it in a way that feels safe and gentle. There's a good description of something like this um, in the in the story of Fran in in the book in my book. It's not always depression. I show how I work with um, an anxiety, uh, an old anxiety from the death of her parents, and it's by doing a little bit, and then when the anxiety raises too high, you, you pendulate back to grounding and, and breathing and safety, and then you go back. And there's an example of this, because um, depending on whether you can do this on your own or with, a, or with a therapist that knows how to work this way, an AEP therapist or an ISTDP therapist, would, you would have to decide that. But if this were me, I would, I would find a quiet space when it's happening and I would muster again, just a stance of radical compassion and curiosity. And I would just tune into the pure physical sensation as I breathed. And I would just notice after 10 or 20 seconds, what happened to the sensation without judging it, just noticing it. And if it's moving, I can maybe stay with it. If I can imagine or maybe being with it, it brings up memories, or even if I can identify, sometimes you can stay with an anxiety. And uh, there's an exercise on the on the Change Triangle YouTube channel called Dropping Into the Body. Basically, you're you're with the anxiety as, you, as you're anchored in some solid state, some calm state also, which I, I demonstrate. And then you can just ask yourself, if I was to go through that anxiety or move it aside, is there anger there? Is there sadness there? Is there fear there? You can name the seven core emotions and just check off all that you may have. And it's very possible that there's more than one. Most people don't realize we can have more than one emotion happening at the exact same time, which also adds to anxiety. And we can have opposite emotions at the exact same time. Like we have with the, like our parents and the people like, I love you and I hate you. I wanna kill you and I can't live without you. 
-hmm. And what you do with that is you learn to hold them together with like imagining lots of space and air in between each one. And you get to know each one because each emotion works. It has its wow. own program. And what we try to do, because we don't learn any of this in high school and college or anywhere, is we try to reconcile both emotions and you can't because they're batting up against each other and that's why we feel anxious that creates tension. Yeah, and in therapy you learn to integrate them. So it's that integration mm -hmm. of accepting that you can be angry with a person and you can be sad about your situation, but right. you can also love them. Yeah, and, and that hand that's it's changing the butt to an end, as I yeah. say. Yes. This, this yes. is uh, well, I think you addressed it. this, but you can read uh, Fanny's continuation. I also feel the most agitation when I use my cognitive capabilities to try to resolve the internal crisis. Like it fuels to the fire. I can pause and acknowledge and tune to the complex emotions, and then it's like chasing a cure. He says it gets it gets stronger. So then yes. what? Okay. Yeah, so the idea is to get out of your head. So my whole life, and I think the majority of people on earth do this, we get hit with a feeling and we go up into our head because one, that escapes the, un the discomfort in the body and we try to figure it out. It's counterintuitive. So if you were in uh, a class with me or a training with me and I asked how you were feeling and you said anxiety, the first thing I'd have you do is to, I would say, how do you know you're anxious? What inside your body tells you? And you may, if you're me, you'd say, oh, I, I feel like a tightness in my chest and like a vibration. And then I would say, can you just notice that and breathe and stay with me? And let's just notice if we just tune into the anxiety in the body, not your head, if we go into the body and are just with it, just noticing it the way you would, if I pinched your arm and I said, notice that what that feels like, you're just noticing the sensation of the anxiety as you breathe, waiting 10 seconds if you can. And we're just gonna notice if that makes it go down or if it, gonna, if it makes it go up. And nine times out of 10, counterintuitively, it calms the anxiety, but we all avoid it because we're scared of it. So it's that first leap faith to go into the body and not up into your head so it's not could like you, it's not like it gets you, worse before it gets also, better it's just no. it's just yeah most just, of the time it just calms down and it has to do with the left brain and right brain integration and the executive functioning uh on you know through the the um the the, the, the all those midbrain structures here i have a, this here here's my brain so emotions get triggered yeah, what? No lemon. No, no, now we don't need the lemon squeezer. This is an actual fake, real fake brain. So the emotions get triggered in the middle of the brain and then they go down into the body. It's like it's reversed, so left, right. Down, down here is going into the body. When we can use noticing, and that's why mindfulness, I often call the change triangle mindfulness with a map because we're not going in to notice and evacuating our body, we're going in to notice whatever we're sensing. And through the noticing in the body, we're creating integration all through here and it calms everything down. And it sets the stage for processing emotions, for healing and, and reorganizing the brain. Changing it. Could you also expand on that now about the pathways, the pathways of anxiety? Because what Fanny is talking about is a, a cognitive perceptual disruption that occurs. So this is an opportunity for us to actually explore that area, if if that's all right with you. Yeah, and this is also another. This is in this is more from ISTDP, where anxiety can be in the uh, in the striated muscles. That's where we get tense in our neck and our back. It could be in the smooth muscles. That's when we get a knot in our stomach. And, um, you know, we pee and have to go to the bathroom a lot. And it can also cause cognitive disruptions like dizziness, out-of-body experiences, dissociations. And clinically, as a therapist, you'd work with them in, in different ways. But the, the idea would be the same, that we're trying to get back and get kind of move it into the muscles so that we can move it out. 
Yeah. And, and, and so you just mentioned um, ear ringing, tinnitus again, which in my experience, I work with somebody that gets, whenever their anxiety goes up, they hear that ear ringing. And yeah. it's tricky to get to. Uh, some of these things are very, very deep from neglect from the get-go and trauma from the get-go. And so they're wired in deeply. And that's when things like transmagnetic stimulation and um, Porges has an SSP protocol and neurofeedback. These are these other ways to try to get a little bit deeper into the uh, the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but, the, but have, the, the mindful stance really does help moving emotions through the body does an, an awful lot. And the, yeah. And, Borrowing on the relationship to create, and it can become a habit. A person can be, become a pattern. Oh, there's that emotion. Um, I'm in a new pattern of watching it and not chasing it or fixing it. Yes. I'm just going to watch it, which is so hard to do, right, Rose? It's like it's so hard to watch and observe your feelings. Yeah, it's really it's like because, enormous. Well, you it's can't find the feeling because it's not. It's locked away. Yeah. So, but the anxiety, <laughs> adding to that, Tova, the anxiety is so frightening that you have to push the anxiety away. So, yeah. And that's the defenses, the sort of the defense anxiety on the top of the triangle that we sort of oscillate yeah. between that. And we just have to get, bring it down into the body to move through it. Wow. And anytime I have any type of feeling or body sensation, I just meditate on it, basically. I, I, I find a nice, quiet space. Then I muster up my compassion and curiosity in myself. And I'll just stay with it and breathe and notice what happens. And if you know that in itself is the capacity to do that does a whole bunch of things. Wow. Um, and sometimes people can do that really right away, especially if they're used to medit meditating and they've had some therapy. And sometimes they really need a therapist to do it with, which makes sense. There's nothing bad about that. It's a good thing to go to therapy. It's like gym for the brain. Um, gym for the brain. I love it. <laughs> um, and it just, it's, it's growth. It's so, oh my God, I can't imagine life with all the, without all the therapy that I I think when people go to therapy, they're strong. Yeah. Society says you're weak. I says it's a strength okay. to look at yourself. Absolutely. It's much harder to be with an emotion than it is to bury it or to avoid it. Right. So I tell that a lot when I when I develop uh, so stuff for men in particular that it takes a tremendous amount of strength and, um, yeah. and it's so wonderful to be able to get in touch with all aspects of ourselves. It's, it's it just we feel much more connected to who we are, and then you learn how to express these things in ways that aren't humiliating to you and and attract other people who also want to know you and be with you and it's just an upward spiral of, of good things and um so i would encourage everybody to learn as much as they can about emotions and core emotions and to read my book or to to access the free if you don't like to read yeah. um lots and lots of resources free resources on my well, website everything everything's on the total yes total, so would you put on the uh, on hillary's um website address now too please yes. The website. Yeah. I have a, a newsletter I send out once a month. If you want to stay in w touch, www. I don't inundate your mailbox with spam. Yeah. Um, H-E-N-D-E-L.com. Okay, they can sign up for the newsletter in the uh, website. Yeah, go poke around and see what's there. Yeah. There's videos, there's articles. Oh, yeah. And we've also got a newsletter, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Please, we, we, and <laughs> let me put in this little plug while there's a chance. We very rarely plug. Yes, we, we advertised Hillary. We've advertised <laughs> Hillary. We updated that Hillary's coming and she's here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell them about our website. Because there's so, you know what? We tell people, Rose and I, it's you can learn so much because you're the doctor, you're the psychologist, we're the, you know, the messenger, but you can learn this on your own. You know, because I think a lot of people have, have some blocks about the finances and they've been through so much and why is this going to help? It's like, and even if it was for free, they wouldn't get better. It's like the, when the teacher, the students writing, the teacher will come. Yeah. 
and learning learning about yourself just arms you with what you need to know to get the, the proper kind of care and the proper type of support. And there's many, many ways. This Emotions Education 101 class that I started teaching with uh, another AEDP therapist, it's not therapy. It's a, it's a psychoeducational class, but we do experiential exercises. So it's highly therapeutic. The, um, the feedback has been enormous in terms of them getting more out of the class than years of therapy because in, in therapy, often traditional therapy, people, the therapist is keeping you intellectualized. It's keeping you in your head. And it's not the therapist's fault, that's how they're trained. It's just that it's, for some reason, this information is just slow to translate into mainstream. And my theory is it's because everybody is, is we live in an emotion phobic world and people are afraid of emotions because so much damage is done in, this, in the name of emotions. But experiencing emotions is only an internal experience. It has nothing to do with the actions that then have to be thought through carefully so that we are constructive in our relationships and constructive at our jobs. So learning about emotions is not permission. It's not like granting permission to behave badly. It's two separate things. It's the processing of emotions and then thinking through behaviors. Same thing as like all the parents out there with their children, you wanna to learn to help them. You wanna validate your children's emotions and then direct their behaviors so that they can thrive in life. And um, they're, they're Beautifully said. them separately. Yeah. 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 Um, last week, uh, Wednesday, we had a special show with Dr. David Schechter, who worked with Dr. Sarno, um, was in the movie, has written a book, a couple of books. And he's got a new project about um, helping the school systems start to bring into the health education TMS for youths. And I, I imagine, like, he's looking for people to work with him and support him. and taking this longer what if that you made a triangle for the chill for the teens for teens uh, the 20 to 19, like we could make a triangle for the children and this could and be it's, a, it's the same triangle to yeah, yeah. But, yeah exactly um so we put smiley faces on it or something yes, like somebody actually made a video um in the silicon valley um children's health service that they took because this is all anyone can take this and, and turn wow. it into any type of resources. I want this stuff to get out there. This is like the labor of love. It's yeah. I don't I don't own it. Um, I trademarked it so that when people use the word change triangle, they can't do sinister things with it. So I can say, you know, if you're not using it the right way. But it's meant to be taken and shared and talked about. And the book can be can be used, can be read together, it can be read in book groups, and you work through the exercises and you read these touching stories of the people's courage and working through emotions and healing trauma. So that would be a great thing. I hope to, I hope David Schechter knows about the triangle. I made a note to connect him to you just so he could have yeah. a, a, a graphic to you. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Rose? <laughs> If we could just go back to Fanny for a moment sure. and, and allow her to see that it's not it, what what she's in her. The last thing her, she said, he said, Fanny, yeah, Fanny's yeah, from, uh, yeah. but he's in yeah. Ireland. I remember speaking to him. How can he, how, how can, how can I be disengaged when it is such a strong signature in the mind and body? Rose, do you want to address that? Thank you. Uh, part, part of what's happening for Fanny is that, um, as Hillary just said, um, we've got to turn ourselves, how would I put it? We've got to turn our feelings towards ourselves, have empathy for what's happened to us. But Tova also said a few moments ago, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And I think Fanny, that it, it's probably the most important thing, that somehow you're not ready yet to actually turn, turn, how would I say it, Hillary? Turn around well, and see that you're, you're worthy or you're... Well, it's also painful and scary. Yeah. I think I'm not, is Fanny, Fanny, are you saying that you would like to be disengaged, but it's too hard because it's so painful? No, no, it's how painful. can he, how can he, like, how can he, I think what he's saying is how can he be disengaged when it is such a strong signature? Like, yeah. it's so big in his mind, how can he disengage from it and go into his heart? Yeah. So I'd have to ask Fanny if that's what he yeah. means. 
if the goal is to be disengaged or if the goal is to engage with your body. Beautifully um, said, yeah. But but the but that 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 is the work is to is to disengage from the the mind and to go in which which one was exactly exactly <laughs> um I think what I said because I've I've yeah. met him. Yeah. So we have to turn our attention to the physical sensation. And if it's too painful, just go around the edges. I would like to dis I would like to dissociate it with that sensation that's traumatic. We'd like to separate from it. Yes. But that's not the thing that's going to I mean, if we could, that would be great. I mean and, and when defenses work. They, they work well and the people coming into therapy are not where the people where their defenses are working. I would like to be dissociated with that sensation that's traumatic. Yes, I totally understand that. The, the problem is that it doesn't, that's not gonna be healing. And if you can't check out of it without it compromising other aspects of your life, then the next thing would be to learn as much as you can about trauma and about emotions and to begin to maybe if you can find a therapist who works this way that can help you be with the sensations and find their meaning that they're they're communicating with you that they want attention that's why you're feeling it and they want attention because there's something unresolved that needs healing and you have to find someone that can help you feel safe enough to turn towards those the body and see what you can do to liberate the emotions, to become aware of um, the meaning of the symptom and wow. where it comes from and how to heal. Hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it's too hard to go there for people. Like, as you said, you virtually have to roll up your sleeves and do the work because it is work, isn't it? Looking yeah. back. At our feelings, yeah. oh, it is. It's 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 hard work, but it's very mm. good work. And often, with the right therapist, you feel um, better sooner. That the idea is not to lead someone to re-traumatize them and lead someone into pain. What we say in AEDP is that the that the very last step is something that's supposed to feel good. So that even if you've done a hard session you regroup to talk about what's it like to do this work so that that is leading somewhere positive and you can feel good even if it even if it hurts it's like exactly. you know, like it's an, again like exercise like if you do a really good workout at the gym the next day you may be you, you may be in such pain that you can't even walk but then you feel better the next day and you know that you're hurting for a good reason not because exactly. you're, you're repeating a trauma like banging your head against the wall that that doesn't help yeah. 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 Hillary, thank you so much. It's right. just been a beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. It's like we had a session. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. No, it was like you just explained it very well. I love the basics. I mean, we had uh, Martin Scorman on a few times, and he also had this way of, but he's very different than you. It's like you have your way, and it's it was very clear and very understanding, and it was like I felt excited for people. I felt like a new inspiration because it just it's nothing new under the sun but the way that you bring it to the table was just so it's just the truth the truth will set you free it's so it's like there's no other way for people to go this is the way yeah yeah oh, thank you so much it's for having me. Yeah. really appreciate having the opportunity to share the change triangle and to share yeah. the resources and thanks the, hillary um, yeah yeah. So thank you all for listening out there and just keep learning just keep learning it really helps to learn it makes the um experiences that we suffer from much less scary when they're demystified and you yes. know what's happening um and you know there's a biology of hope and belief don't give up because that's chemically you're on your road and i you know i was always taught that sometimes when it's the most painful we're close and isn't it true that like we're so close to healing you know, or uh, aha moment and we stop if, like because and if we would just that's the moment when we want to stop like don't stop moving keep moving through the pain and then you're there it's like mm -hmm. 
And then you can look on that, like you said, on the other side. So mm -hmm. I, I, I encourage people. Um, but it's like jumping off a cliff. That's so scary, right? That's that's why I wanted to show the stories in the book to show that moment of the of of that and of going into freedom. It. It's and freedom. What yeah, like truly flying. So we'll have you back again. We'll make we'll bring Michael Galinsky back. It'll be a wonderful another wonderful roundtable. So keep in touch with us. And um, if anyone has any questions for Hillary, um, you can find her information on our on our. Our website and our Facebook page and Rose was around this morning if anyone um, oh thank you the biology of hope oh yes no it's chemical it's chemical the biology of gratitude the biology of hope so it's very chemical when we're hopeful um, anyway so nice and Rose I just okay. love hanging out with you on a Monday oh thank you Tova <laughs> and thank you Hillary for being yeah. our guest Thank, Thank you. you. It's been Thank so beautiful. You everybody out there. Okay. Good night. God bless. And and before we close.